All right, we are back to more presentations to go here in the architecture track on day two of spring one. I am so happy to have the next two gentlemen up here. As I said in our outro, we have Madhav and my good friend Rohit. We're going to talk to us about APIs and events. And again, I'm just so happy to see Rohit on the other side of the camera since he's been stuck backstage with me for the last two days. So without further ado, I will turn it over to my friends Rohit and Madhav. Have at it, friends. Thank you so much. Um, hello and welcome to this session. My name is Madhav Sathe. I'm a cloud applications architect. And with me, we have Rohit Kelapure, who is a solutions architect at VMware. Today, we are going to look at two app modernization strategies, API first or events first. Is it a binary choice or there is a spectrum of choices? We will look at their business imperatives and see how they both are the building blocks of the modern applications. We will share a decision tree that will help you create a mental model to pick the right solution for the problem. Next. First, let us understand the fundamental difference. In case of APIs, the consumer directly calls the API to perform an operation. The operation could be a command, it could be a query, or it could be a combination. The API could be a microservice or a facade for a legacy application. In most modern systems, you will end up using service mesh or API gateway for discovery and networking. In case of events, the producer just publishes a fact as an event to the broker. Any broker can, ex any consumer can express interest in the event by subscribing to the topic. Here, the broker provides a level of indirection. And there are different types of popular brokers out there, Kafka, Google Pops Up, RabbitMQ. Next. Let us take a look at business imperative of APIs. The API gateways help here with the outside in view from the consumption point of view. They make the APIs easily discoverable to internal and external developers. Here we are talking about the APIs that can expose any of the digital assets to unlock new business channels. The assets could be your new microservices, legacy or COTS applications, or your SaaS-based cloud-based SaaS applications. Organizations are able to expose uh, their entire business processes as APIs. Take example of Shopify or Stripe or Square. It is opening up new revenue streams. It is unlocking new monetization opportunities. So API adoption also often helps predicting financial performance of the company. Now, when the APIs are exposed to partners or outside world, you have to take care of security and quota and API gateways are great at that. So let's take a look at the business imperatives of the events. Next, yeah. Um, Events-driven uh, digital experience presents new economic opportunities. Banks are using it for fraud detection. Modern retail chains are using it for real-time inventory. Next. Events-driven architectures also make systems more malleable. You can independently add or remove microservices that will act on events without disrupting the rest of the system. You can build on the outside. You can start emitting events from the monolith to the outside world and expose those events and start building new functionality on top of that. That gives you agility and speed to market. Finally, it has opened up a new cloud operating model such as FAS and, or function as a service and serverless platform. Serverless platform and FAST, they have some things in common, such as they can scale to zero and they pretty much help you in terms of uh, new billing paradigms and new billing strategies that will reduce your cost drastically and reduce your operation overhead drastically. Next. Here, we are looking at maturity model of events. This is based on Martin Fowler's article. We made a slight change and added event streaming to the mix. On the left-hand side, we have thin events. They are just facts without a state. For example, order placed, customer added. They typically require some sort of API calls to extract the state afterwards. 
Next, we have facts with the state. We call them thick events. After that, we have CQRS and event streaming. We think event streaming, uh, particularly stateful event streaming, is slightly harder to build. And that is because you often end up uh, building streaming applications that require aggregations, windowing, joining data from multiple sources, or joining data from moving objects to uh, more of a uh, k-table kind of objects. So that really helps to uh, create really complex streaming applications. Although it could be slightly easier to design architecturally than CQRS. CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Finally, there is event sourcing on the far end of the spectrum. And generally, it is not a recommended approach unless you have really, really good experts at designing them. Next. Here, we are going to take a look at some of the heuristics. The idea here is to uh, give you the enough data points to make the right choice, make the right decision. We can't go through the details of this whole decision tree. So take a pause and revisit this later on. For example, take, uh, take a look at business or access aspects when you're deciding whether you want to use event-based architecture or API-based architecture. Are you going to use modern applications with BFF or are you going to modernize your data transformation layer for modernizing ETL? Or you want to build some kind of a combination using CTRS pattern? So look at various uh, aspects that are necessary for you to decide. And uh, you will learn that APIs and events are not mutually exclusive. Instead, you will often end up using a healthy combination of the two. As I said, take a pause on this, on this one when you have a recording and revisit this and use it as a mental model to take a design the strategy. Next. This is an excellent quote from Fred Brooks. We're going to walk through a few steps of evolving architecture. Let us start with the monolith. This is a simple monolith, which has two modules, customer module and order module. And both these modules have a shared database. This is a classic application. They share the runtime uh, and they are running as part of the same process. If you want to change any one of the modules, you still have to deploy the entire monolith and you can't scale them independently. Next. So we do some modernization. We break down the monolith to microservices. Now they both can be independently deployed and scaled. And each will have its own API, but they still depend on the shared data model. Now that is still a tight coupling. So even though they are now microservices, there's still a tight coupling due to the shared database. Next. So we made some more progress on top of it. We did the hard task of separating the data model across the two services. And now, if you want to access each other, you access only exclusively via the APIs. This is a really good progress towards loose coupling. However, still there is a temporal coupling. That is because you both have, you need to have both the customer service and order service. They need to be running uh, when they need each other. Next. Finally, we have uh, here events-driven architecture. Customer and order service each populate their thick events to the topic or the broker, and each maintains a local query view of the external data models. Now this leads to fast access to the local data. It doesn't require queries or calls to be made outside. And all the data that order service needs is available locally. Now there is a slight uh, impact of duplication here. And because the events are processed to maintain the local query view, there is also something you have to deal with regarding the eventual, incons uh, eventual consistency due to the potential lag. Next. When we evolve applications, you always have to take into account backward compatibility. Otherwise, things are going to break. For APIs, the externally observed behavior 
is the contract with the consumer. You can include Spring Cloud contracts in your CI pipeline to check for backward compatibility of the API. For event, it's going to be slightly tricky. So for that purpose, you should use events with encoding standards that support schemas. Once you have that, uh, for example, Argo or Protobuf, then you can treat event schemas as API contracts. Here, external schema registries can help you to ensure compatibility and you can declare what sort of compatibility you need in the system. Further, you can uh, take example of Confluent Schema Registry. The Confluent Schema Registry use, can be used uh, in the CI pipeline thanks to the Maven plugin. Next. Just to wrap up, uh, there are some design considerations. Complete decoupling comes with a cost, so you have to take care of delivery guarantees um, and the state management uh, due to the, the saga patterns to handle the eventual consistency. With that, I will hand it over to Rohit. All right, thank you, Madhav. So events and APIs are the core building blocks for modern applications today. Um, in this talk, we wanted to present a view that, is, that goes slightly deeper than the usual framing of APIs versus events. Uh, an excellent way of looking at things is through analogies. A, and uh, a good analogy is, is uh, this is a good one, which is calculus-based. So if you look at events, events are records or facts. And a series of events, can, uh, when you build up a series of events, you, you get to the current state of the system. So that is the exact definition of an integral, where the integral of a function is basically the sum of all the infinitesimal contributions to, the, to a sum by a function. It's the area under the curve. So if you do a left fold of all the events from time B to time C, you get to the current state of the system, which is the area under the curve. So events and the folding of events over a particular period of time gives you the current state of the system. This is how event sourcing systems are built um, and they're grounded in uh, this reality of basically a, a set of events when you sum it up becomes an integral. Now APIs are slightly different, they are more complicated and a derivative is usually a rate of change of, of some quantity with respect to a particular variable. In this case, the quantity is a service and the variable which in, or in, in a system is data or objects or resources. So here again, an API can be considered as a derivative because it gives us, it, it quantifies the instantaneous state of the system and quantifies the rate of change of the system with respect to data, objects or resources. So APIs and events, you can think of them as derivatives and integrals. There are multiple ways of thinking about the maturity of APIs. There is a famous uh, model called the Richardson model of API, Richardson API maturity model. I like the Amundsen API maturity model better because I think it reflects more the reality of how APIs are used. So as you climb the maturity model, from L0 to L3, L0 is bad and L3 is probably where you want to be. So the lowest level of APIs are these database centric APIs, where essentially the API exposes the data model of the system. A good example of this is Power Builder, like Power, uh, these APIs used in client server systems, where the entire state of the database is exposed just as is through an API. So you end up building these applications that are completely coupled to the database. The second level of APIs is object-centric APIs. Over here, API is the exposed object model. If you have a canonical object model of the enterprise and you expose APIs on top of that, then you, are, you have an object-centric API. A good example of this is the, is the SOA-based API, service-oriented architecture APIs. Object-centric APIs often have Vizdils and have SOAP-style implementation. A good example of a database-centric API is you have a customer table or a invoice table, whereas an object-centric API exposes a customer's uh, summary resource, but on the customer's uh, summary object, you have 
uh, you have various API to suspend, to read, to update. So you go from a table-centric view to an object-centric view. And the next level is resource-centric APIs. In a resource-centric API, the API is modeled as a set of HTTP resources. An example is, give me the customer summary with a certain custom I, uh, customer ID. APIs are, more, are act on re resources, and these resources are customers, uh, customer summary, uh, or let's say invoices or visits. Uh, in this case, you typically have a, a JSON or a REST-based API. Um, most of the modern APIs kind of start off resource-centric, but I think today drift towards object-centric, object-centricity. The last set of APIs is the most complex, is, is the most sophisticated form of APIs. These are called affordance-centric APIs. And the significance here is that the, the API is exposed as a series of structured messages that has both control information and data information within them. So looking at the information that is, that is returned by an affordance-centric API, you, like for instance, a hypermedia-based API, you can then navigate the object hierarchy and, and, and basically do all the product-oriented uh, API calls. A good example of an affordance-centric API is customer summary, customer uh, uh, record, or customer filter, customer suspend. These are higher level product centric, use case centric APIs, and you don't have, you don't deal at the level of individual resources, but rather higher level product level constructs that, uh, that combine both control and data information. This is a good mental model of thinking about APIs. So you have these different kinds of APIs. We also covered the maturity model for events. How do you put things together? A good example, over here, what, what is shown on the screen now is a Uber food system. Thanks to the pandemic, we are now spending a lot of time at home. A lot of us order food from Uber Eats or whatever app you have. This is a model of a Uber food system. Like for instance, when an order is placed, we have a restaurant service that probably cares that an order has been placed. So how do you model that interaction? The, the order service emits an event called order placed on a topic, which is listened to by the restaurant. The restaurant now understands that an order has been placed. Now, if, you, if it is a thin event, the restaurant goes back to the order and gets the details of the order. Or if it's a thick event, then the restaurant already has all the information it needs. So any system is, is basically an amalgamation of events and APIs. Now, depending on how you want to, do you want to have thin events, thick events, uh, do you want to completely build the system using domain objects and, to, and use events as the system of record? Then you can you go towards event source. This sort of modeling of information and data and flow between these services, this, di this specific diagram, uh, some in DDD terms, it's called a context mapping. A context map, it, uh, this is also, uh, this is not exactly a context map. This, we, in, uh, we call this diagram a Boris diagram. So when you have event-driven architectures, which are inherently loosely coupled, there is a, how do you manage the life cycle of an object? How do you manage a, a business and end-to-end -end, um, business process that needs to get orchestrated across multiple discrete services? And so for this, you use a, the Saga pattern. Um, and the, the docket-based choreography is one of the concrete implementations of the Saga pattern. Now, taking our Uber Foods example, when a driver has to be onboarded onto the, onto the Uber Eats platform, a certain set of things, a certain set of activities and tasks have to be completed. For instance, the insurance information has to be validated, his credit check has to be done, a automobile safety record has to be fetched of the of the particular automobile. Now, in the old way of doing things, we could have orchestrated all these checks to downstream services and then bubbled up the information to our consumer. But in a uh, event-driven architecture where everything is loosely coupled, we have these discrete services, the DMB service, the credit background service, and the insurance service. We want them to evolve independently. So how do we do this? We use this docket-based choreography pattern where the docket service, which is, which is the, uh, think of this as the supervisory service, puts out an information that says, I need 
the uh, the information for driver ID one two three four five. So once a driver info needed event is put on the queue, that is the trigger to all of these downstream services to start doing those to start doing that processing. Now, for instance, the DMV may need the actual license of the driver. So the DMV service once it listens to the driver uh, driver info needed event goes back to be to the uh, to goes back. To the driver microservice and uh, to the customer service and gets the identity of the driver out. So all of these discrete services or these docket services complete their respective processes either independently or by going back and getting more information. And eventually, the they they call back the docket service and check off all the statuses and tasks. At some point, your manifest is complete and the object uh, can, can then be uh, migrated from info needed to driver uh, uh, to the driver onboard approve driver onboarding approved so if you have a set of tasks and activities and a set of things that needs to happen for a business process to transition from one state to another modeling the saga pattern as a docket this choreography helps you reduce the uncertainty of, of managing events and apis Another way of designing, of using events and APIs together, increasingly we are now seeing models where you have stateful microservices, event streaming based stateful microservices. E event streaming is a paradigm that has caught on. It's a form of event driven architecture where you have an unbounded, continuously updating, ordered stream of events coming through. So, in these, when you have a continuous stream of events, you need to process those events. Uh, to maintain state, and those operations are aggregations, joins, windowing. The example over here is a series of inventory update events that come in from all the stores on the edge, which are then ingested on a particular topic. And then the inventory processor processes all these updates, windows them, aggregates them, so that inventory is calculated on a per store basis, on a per SKU basis, and then the updated inventory after aggregation after after this uh, using the streaming streams api using stream processing operations like flat map and aggregation and joins you now have an accurate inventory of the item which is this balance on hand and you use a sync processor to write this to a system of record event streaming specifically stateful event streaming is an excellent way to modernize your batch processes to modernize old school etl processes and represents a new paradigm in just continuously in this uh, in, in writing uh, event-based microservices. Finally, to bring it all together, our recommendation is to start with APIs and API gateways to drive a consumer-centric, a value-driven approach to developing new systems or more than modernizing monoliths. One, once you figure out what the seams of the applications are, what your APIs are, now you can expose some of the internal state through events. You can expose the internal life cycle through events. And what that does is once the events are emitted, it gives you an opportunity to build on the outside, to strangle the monolith using the data that is in the event and leverage patterns like data driven strangler to build a new system and then compare the responses from the old and the new system and eventually retire that, that, from that seam or that capability from the monolith. To leverage events to, to democratize your data and to start building on the outside and to strangle the monolith. Ultimately, your goal should be to, to derive and create your own maturity models for APIs and events and understand how they react and work together to, uh, to, to achieve the, the objectives of your business. Um, you can look at the math models that were given earlier. You can th think about it in that sense. You could use the the concept map that was provided, or you could use the Boris diagrams to design a system. We have, in this talk, presented a, a maturity model for APIs and events, and also explained how they can be brought together and, and systems can be designed to handle the uncertainty when these come together in an event-driven architecture and in API-driven architecture. Um, with that, I think we are at the end of our time. Um, Thank you so much. We, we also have a Zoom, uh, a, a separate breakout Zoom for Q&A. If you have questions, please join us there. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. 
Awesome. Thank you, my friends. And Rohit, like a boss, ends almost to the second on time. I'm so proud of you, my friend. Thank you. All right. You can continue the conversation in the Q&A Zoom link. You can just click on that Join the Discussion link. That will take you into the Slack channel where you can see the link to that particular Zoom room. Guess what, friends? One more presentation to go. So get yourself something to drink, stretch your legs, hit the restroom, and we'll be back with the State of Steel Toe 2020. Thank you.